what in the world is happening before Yeshua returns. It was uh, 20 years ago I wrote the book, The Mystery of Iniquity, detailing the legal prerequisites for the return of the Messiah. And there are so many things that must transpire before the Messiah returns, before Yeshua returns to rule the earth. Whereas most of the world is thinking that the next thing on the prophetic calendar is a return, far from it. We have with us our guest Shabbat Night Live for the last three weeks, Joel Richardson, the author of many books, uh, one of my favorite titles in the world, When a Jew Rules the World, because that who is who is gonna rule the world, Yeshua from the tribe of Judah, the Mideast Beast, and his New York Times bestseller, The Islamic Antichrist. His background and his calling in life the way he has been led by the Spirit has taken him into the depths of the Islamic faith, into understanding the Muslims and how to be able to reach them with the gospel of the kingdom. And so we have him back with us to discuss more of what's going to be transpiring before the Messiah returns because you need to understand the brimstone is about to hit the fan. Joel, good to have you back with us. Great to be back, Michael. And of course, Joel, uh, you, uh, uh, your, your, your namesake, uh, uh, the prophet Joel, who gave us some very detailed descriptions about what is uh, uh, getting ready to transpire in the land of Israel right now. And uh, uh, this is uh, a, a very exciting time in which we're living right now uh, because uh, you, are, you are seeing and have been put in the midst of the, uh, the Islamic world, going in and doing relief missions uh, into uh, northern Iraq and all. And so uh, you're, you are actually have learned how to be able to speak to them. And you have three things. You said you, there are three things that you really need to know about Islam in order to be able to, to speak into their world. Uh, tell us what that is before we get into the prophetic scriptures here. Yeah, I mean, it's not even necessarily three things that every Christian needs to know about Islam. The, these are three things that I say any Christian can do if you want to reach Muslims. And okay. it, it, I go, because I just lay this out, it's so easy. The first thing is you love them. So, uh, you know, there's been studies that have been done, 85% of all former Muslims that have come to faith in Yeshua, they say the reason that they came into faith was because a Christian, a Messianic Jew that's a believer loved them. And so first of all, you love them. And what that means is you get to know them individually, you invite them to your house, you invite them out to dinner, you actually talk to them, build a relationship. Very simple, love them. Okay, now, now how do you do that? Because that, that seems to be a fairly scary thing. You, you see a woman with a head scarf on and uh, what, what people are gonna think is that, you know, she's got a bomb strapped to herself or whatever. You know, all the pictures that we get from that. But uh, you, you have seen that the, the Muslims are much more God conscious than any uh, Western Christians. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, obviously within social norms, uh, you know, within the Islamic world or the, the East, a woman is going to approach a woman. A man's going to approach a man. You know, you don't walk up to, a man doesn't walk up to a Muslim woman and say, hey, how'd you like to come to my house for dinner? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's not the way to do it. But, um, you know, basic Middle Eastern norms, you know, we're allowed to make mistakes as, as Westerners and that's okay. But you know, you build a relationship. I'm a naturally evangelist. I like to go out and if someone just out and about, I can spark up a conversation. Muslims are some of the easiest people to spark a conversation with. So if you bump into somebody at the market, I personally love going to some of the Middle Eastern uh, markets on a Friday. Hmm. Everyone gets out of mosque, they're going there to buy their food. I go there to buy a falafel, buy some, you know, whatever, and you strike up a conversation. And right out of the bat, I'll say, hey, I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible is the word of God. You know, and you're just friendly. You build, and next thing you know, you're going to have this intense theological discussion. You say, I'd love to do this again. Can we exchange numbers? I'd love to get together for lunch someday. You know, if you're, and you know, you just love them just like normal people. You get to know them. You find out, oh, wow, this guy doesn't want to behead me. Uh, he doesn't mm. want to, you know, kill my family and this sort of thing. Well, that's an interesting concept because in any medium-sized city, there is going to be a halal market. Uh, you know, there's several here around Charlotte, North Carolina. So, uh, idea of uh, going in there, getting groceries, so you can spark up, uh, strike a, a conversation with someone, and talk about the God of uh, of Abraham. 
Uh, they, they may think that he is Allah, but, uh, but at least there, there's common ground there. Yeah, you know, I'll be honest, I even uh, will sometimes go outside of mosques. Now, you have to find the right mosque on a Friday, everyone's going to pray. So you find a mosque that's not all fenced in and gated, maybe it's a little bit more in a city where they have to park down the street. So you stand on the public sidewalks, otherwise, you know, they'll think you're there to cause trouble. And I'll stand there and give out Arabic New Testaments. I have a friend that wrote a little book, it's called Dear Muslim Friend. I'll hand that out, I'll compliment them as they're mm. going in. Hey, best dressed guy in the mosque today. Good, you know, hey, hey, thank you. And, you know, just give out. And it's amazing how warm and receptive most of them are. As long as you're nice and, you know, not these jerks that are out there just with a bullhorn, saying, you know, screaming and ripping up the Quran. Look, that's not gonna help anyone. Um, so, you know, you, you build in relationships, you invite them out for lunch. So first of all, you love them. That's number okay. one. Okay. Number two, we have the Holy Spirit. Pray for them. So as you get to know somebody, you find out what their needs are, and you say, hey, you know, uh, Ahmad, I want you to know I'm going to be praying for you, and then pray for them. Don't just tell them you're gonna pray for them, actually pray for them, and if the opportunity is there, if they have some physical issue, you know, you say, hey, I, or you know, some crisis in their life, can I actually, Jesus actually laid hands on people and he prayed for them, can I do it like that? Do you mind if I pray for you right here and right now? and give the Holy Spirit the opportunity to do what he does best, which is reveal the Father to those that are genuinely searching. You know, Muslims, when they pray, they say, oh Allah, guide me to the straight path. Now, if they are praying sincerely, if they are truly searching, and they're truly saying it to the God they don't know, the God that they can't know, and they are granted Allah of the Quran, in my opinion, is the Satan of the Bible, but if someone who's sincere, crying out to the God that they believe is the creator of heaven and earth, they call him Allah, I believe the one true God says, I'm going to reveal myself to that one. And so we give the opportunity, we give the Holy Spirit the opportunity to do his work. It's not about our great apologetics, argument skills or social skills, yeah. let God mm -hmm. do what he does. So you love them, you let the Holy Spirit do his work, you pray for them, and then give them the scriptures. Give them a gift uh, edition of the scriptures. Um, if they can read English, give them, you know, you can give them the whole Bible, you can just give them the Psalms, and you get them something in their hands so they can read about Jesus because the Quran talks about Jesus, but only in a, a little bit. And most Muslims, if they're sincerely seeking, if they will start reading the scriptures, they will start to fall in love with the Jesus that's revealed in the Bible. You know, I met uh, a couple years ago now, I was in Turkey, and I met with um, this very prominent Muslim leader. His name is Adnan Oktar. He's, he's actually the most published author in the whole Islamic world. He's got like 300 books translated in dozens upon dozens of languages. He has a TV show, and uh, I was on with him, and you know, I just sat down with him, and just very clearly, I looked him in the eye, and I said, I would like to invite you to become a follower of Jesus. And I said, but I want to make it very, very clear, not the false Jesus of the Quran, but the true Jesus of the Bible, the historical Jesus of the Bible. And I said to him, I said, you know, I want you to know that if you accept my invitation, you'll have great tribulation and persecution in this, in this age, but you'll have a guaranteed place in the kingdom of the Messiah when he returns. So, but if you reject my invitation, your eternity, I can promise you, your eternity will be in the hellfire. And, um, you know, this was live on TV, you know, translated into multiple languages all over the world. And, um, you know, he, he, he really got frazzled. He's not an easy guy to frazzle. But we need to be bold. You know, if Donald Trump... Well, well obviously, that's pretty, pretty bold, Joel. If Donald uh, Trump can stand before the media, and I don't even know if he had the spirit of God or not, but just call the entire American media and say fake news and just confront them for their then we as Christians can be bold. We have the message of life. We have the words of life. And so fourth, I'll add the fourth thing, is get to know and study Islam. Because if you respect someone, you're gonna to get to know what they believe so that you can have a more substantial conversation. You have to know the pitfalls to avoid. But most people will say get to know Islam first, then start reaching Muslims. I say no, love them, pray for them, give them the scriptures first, and don't be afraid to build your boat at sea which means go out there, make mistakes. Yeah, Don't yeah, be afraid yeah. of being embarrassed mm -hmm. and not having the answers because if you have an ego like most people and you, you can't answer, you're gonna go home and study and you're not gonna mm -hmm. be made a fool of next time and that can become your education. But um, if we'll give ourselves to Muslims, the bottom line is evangelism works 
and the evangelism, the lousy, messy evangelism that I'm doing is much better than the evangelism that most Christians are not doing. And so we need to open yeah, our mouths. Yeah. Well, uh, as you were beginning, as you know, as we were talking about this to begin with, it, it just was really weighing on my heart because when you talked about reaching the Muslims and being evangelistic, you know that that's that's how I live too. You know, I'm always looking for, uh, I'm always kicking doors in, but yet. As far as the Muslim world, every time I see someone that's obviously a Muslim, it's like I, 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 I want to say something, I don't know what to say, and when you began talking about this, it's just a, a confirmation that, you know, I, I just need to, to, to open, up, open up my heart and, and realize that, okay, I, just like in anything, you make mistakes, but you just enter into it and because the Holy Spirit is able to give us revelation Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's a great thing. That's why Satan really can't beat us because he doesn't know everything. The Almighty does, and he can give us revelation to cut through that, and we just have to put ourselves in that place. So uh, you really provoke me to jealousy on that because I, I really uh, know that I have been remiss and knowing that I, I'm lacking in that particular thing. With, uh, the, with the uh, different works that you've done, I know you've done a lot of DVDs and books. Is there, uh, what, what can you suggest to help someone get to know Islam in a, in, in a way that it's not just uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the Antichrist or uh, the Mindy's Beast, but it's like, okay, what's in it and how do I take that information and turn it into a loving relationship with someone? Yeah, so I'm gonna refer anyone first thing to a ministry that I'm partnered with, and it's a website that anyone can go to. It's called The Wadi. Thewadi.com. The Wadi. Is that W-A-D-I, thewadi.com, okay. Yeah, I, it might be .org. But it's, okay. it's either .com or .org. And of course, Wadi being the, the river. The dry river bit. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but basically what this is, is dozens of classes where this ministry that I, again, partner with called I Squared Ministries, what they've done for the past uh, probably 15, 20 years is they've traveled all over the world, collected some of the best teachers in the world on various subjects that, is, that teach about a 10-hour course on every subject you can imagine. Cultural issues, women's issues in Islam, the history of the development of the Quran, textual criticism, mm. um, cultural issues in the Arab world, you name it, street evangelism, anything you can imagine, there is probably a 10 hour class. You can do it all for free. You can go online on the Wadi, sign up, and when you come out of this, you are going to be the most trained evangelist to the Muslim world if that's what you're called to do, and it's all wow. free. Wow, that is, that is incredible, yeah, beautiful. Okay, well, let's, uh, let, let's talk about uh, uh, the temple. A lot of talk about the, the rebuilding of the temple, the third temple, as a number of years ago, um, that uh, a number of people, Eduardo Reconati, one of the original founders of the Temple Treasures Institute, uh, uh, when things were being discovered up on the Temple Mount, uh, uh, they were, there was a group that was involved in attempting to uh, build another temple that would be adjacent to the Dome of the Rock. They tried to get me involved in it and being a spokesman to do this. I really, frankly, didn't want to touch with the 10-foot pole, but don't we hear a lot about this, uh, you know, whether there is going to be a temple and sacrifices and things like that? Uh, what, what are you hearing about on that? Well, for yeah, people are constantly asking, Joel, are you sure there's going to be a literal something rebuilt in the last days? And you and I were talking a little bit before the show, and I think the scriptures are very clear. Now, whether or not this will be a brick and mortar structure that will take a few years to build, or it could be something as quick as a tent goes up, something will be set in place that will mean the reinstitution of the daily sacrifices. Um, and this is more of your area of specialty in terms of what the sacrifices will be, but the scriptures are clear that something will be set up and then the Antichrist will abolish and, and cause those things to cease. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, we are dealing with this uh, uh, as uh, far as what, what Paul says. You know, he's, he's speaking to the believers of Thessalonica, people that were undergoing a great deal of persecution, tribulation at the time, and he was telling them that their, their tribulation is going to be released. There, there's gonna be... Um, um, 
a, cesa a cessation of the pain and strain of tribulation. Mm -hmm. uh, actually uses the word anison, which means fast pain relief mm -hmm. in, in, in Greek there. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna happen when Yeshua himself is revealed from heaven with the messengers of his might in flaming fire taking vengeance. And, and that we, we have that hope that he's going to deliver us. And then it says, but it says uh, that we are not to be deceived by any means, not by a letter from it, not by a spirit, doesn't matter what happens, that the day of the Messiah is at hand. For that day will not come except first there come hey apostasia. The rebellious stand and the man of sin is revealed. The son of destruction who uh, opposes uh, all that is called God so that he as God sits in the temple of God proclaiming that he is God. Okay, that, that must go down first. Before the, we, the pain and strain of tribulation is relieved, before he comes back with the messengers of his might to do so, and raising the dead, it's, et cetera, before that can happen, we are going to see that, which we also see Yeshua talking about the abomination of desolation. Uh, we see that in the book of Daniel as well. And so we look at that sitting in the temple of God. What does that, what does that mean? And as uh, uh, you were saying, does that mean as it has to be uh, you know, a, a stone, Jerusalem stone edifice? We see in the book of Acts where Peter is speaking, uh, excuse me, I'm not sure if it's Peter at, at this moment, it might have been James. However, it is, no, it is Peter. It's speaking of the Gentiles who, have been, are, who are being brought in. Yep. Okay, Peter was the one who was up there with the household of Cornelius. Mm -hmm. He began speaking and the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they spoke in tongues, these Gentiles. He was called on the carpet when he got back to Jerusalem. That's why I think it was James that, that finally came up with this, that the, the scripture says that the tabernacle of David would be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And the Gentiles will be part of that. Yep. So if the Gentiles are going to be a part of rebuilding the tabernacle of David, obviously these Gentiles being added in, even though this is foreign to us, we don't know what to make of it, but yet obviously there is a, a, a place for the Gentiles in rebuilding of the tabernacle of David. Now, what is the dimensions? I'm going to ask you, what are the dimensions of the tabernacle of David? I don't know. What is it made of? Um, it's, if it's not the same thing as the Mishkan, I thought it was a sort of a tent. Oh, we don't know. <laughs> exactly, we have no idea. Is it a bottler building? Uh, you know, I, yeah. I'm being facetious on that, okay? Yeah. But, but see, the Tabernacle of David was a tent. Okay. There's no dimensions spoken of, and so it was a place where the Ark of the Covenant, when he brought the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh in due course, instead of doing it on his own dog and pony or ox and cart show, instead it was then carried on the shoulders of the priests like it was supposed to. He got up to Jerusalem and was put in this tabernacle, a place for the Ark of the Covenant, which is the throne of the Almighty represented upon the earth. Sure. And so... What does this, taber this, te this temple have to be? Well, we see the tabernacle of David prophesying is being rebuilt. And so that is what I look at. You know, temple, it doesn't have to be like the Mormon tabernacle. It doesn't have to be like Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, mm -hmm. any, any of these things. But a place that where worship is conducted, mm -hmm. and I, I believe that literally the Ark of the Covenant will be removed from where it is in the, the, in the mountain itself and put in there at, the, at the, uh, the culmination of this upcoming war, Joel's War, mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's the way that, that I see it. I, I'm uh, under no delusion that the Almighty is obligated to do everything the way I see it, but we do see that there is going to be a cessation of the sacrifices. Sure, sure. And so there has to be an initiation of the sacrifices in order for that to happen. Yep. And so a lot of Christians think, oh, you know, that's an abomination, having sacrifices. But yet this is what was going on in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. Those believers in Yeshua were going up to the temple at the hours of prayer. It wasn't an abomination to them. And I think it's because most people don't understand what these sacrifices are. Yeah, they don't understand the various forms of sacrifices, the purpose of some of the dif different sacrifices. Um, you know, there's the sin offering, there's all kinds of different offerings. 
And they don't understand the fact that, yes, Yeshua made the once and for all sacrifice that his blood atoned for our sins, but that doesn't mean that there were not other types of sacrifices for uh, if you were to be ritually clean and you know all sorts of different things because the fact of the matter is, no matter, I mean, you cannot get around the fact that Ezekiel um, chapter 40 through 48, you have nine chapters that give a detailed, specific blueprint of this temple that would be rebuilt during the time of Messiah when Yeshua is on the ground in Jerusalem, there will be a temple rebuilt and many of the details regarding the sacrifices mm -hmm. that will take place during that time. Now we go, is that for us? Is that for the Jews that are not, they have not received their resurrection? But I mean, there's so many things, but the bottom line is the Lord does not look negatively on sacrifices. Paul the Apostle went up and he actually made sacrifices. This was after the once and for all sacrifice of Yeshua. Mm -hmm. So right. most evangelical Christians have a skewed perspective on, because we need to take note of this, that the temple that is going to be built that will be then abominated, in order for something to be you know, abominated, it needs to be sacred first. Mm, that's right, that's right. And it's called by Paul the nows, the temple of God. He doesn't call it the temple of the Antichrist, he calls it the temple of God. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's holy. It is, there is a period where, you now granted, you know, it, you talk about controversy, well, I know you've faced your share of controversy over the years and today throughout the body of Messiah and the Messianic movement and much of the Hebrew Roots movement, there's so much controversy over the right application of Torah for, for Jews, Messianic believers, for Gentiles, etc. Can you imagine how controversial it's going to become when there is a temple rebuilt, if indeed they bring out the, the, um, the Ark of the Covenant, but sacrifices take place and this sort of thing, and there is going to be such tremendous controversy within the body of Messiah. And so it's important that we discuss these things now before mm -hmm. it takes place and try to work through the scriptural um, basis for all of these things. But I don't personally see anything wrong with believers, especially Messianic Jews, this is my opinion, participating in some of the practices of the temple during that time. Of course, we have to see what it will become but certainly after the time that the Antichrist abominates it and causes the offerings to cease, obviously that's, um, that's far past time that it's anything that we would go near. But prior to that time, I think there's legitimate biblical reasons to say this is God's house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this is, um, uh, you know, what we do know of, of Daniel in this prophecy concerning this. It, it talks about uh, the 2300, not days, that's English. 2300 evening and mornings. Mm -hmm. Now it's speaking of the evening and morning oblations, that, that, that sacrifice offering. And, and uh, I, I was glad to hear you, you know, talk about you know, going up to the barbecue at Jerusalem because a lot of people don't, you know, when they think of sacrifices, they don't even realize that they get to eat most of the sacrifices, it's a barbecue, they get to eat of it. The priest gets a bit of it, their family gets it, the neighbors get some of it. I mean, it is a glorious sac uh, a, a glorious barbecue in which we are, we are sacrificing and all the fat and, and some of the meat belongs to the Almighty and it's incinerated, but this is a time where you go up, you buy wine, strong drink, the fatted calf, and it's a celebration, not of famous football or basketball stars and drink offerings to them, but no, it's a, it's a drink offering to the Most High, and it's a, and it is a beautiful thing. He's, as it says, he's given us wine uh, to joy the heart. Uh, not not to get drunk, not to not to praise multi-million dollar gridiron gods, but uh, to to praise him and, and to fellowship together in Jerusalem. That we we should look forward to. My mouth watering. But uh, these 2,300 evening and morning, it takes exactly 1,150 days to accomplish 2,300 evening and morning sacrifices. And this is important to understand that this was what was going on in the temple when the apostles were going up, when the man who was who was lame was healed, when all this took place, that the morning sacrifice is the incineration of an entire lamb. Mm. The blood is, when the lamb's throat is cut, the, the blood is caught and it's poured out into the ground. This is what the Torah tells us. Mm. It's poured out in the ground. Why? It's not a blood atonement. Mm. It's poured out in the ground. That, that blood is not significant. It's not put on the altar. And then that entire lamb is completely incinerated. Mm. That is an offering to the Most High, and it's saying in the morning, the creator of the heavens and earth, 
owns the heavens and the earth and, and, uh, and because he created it. Mm -hmm. The evening sacrifice is the creator of the heavens and the earth, owns the heavens and the earth because he has redeemed it. That's what the evening and morning oblations are all about. There is nothing wrong with that. This is something that, that recognizes, okay, you know, this, this animal cost hundreds of dollars and we're gonna completely incinerate this thing. Right. A drink offering is the very finest drink. Uh, you, you think of a Courvoisier, uh, you know, a Louis XIV, pouring, out, pouring it out. Mm -hmm. Why? Because this, we are saying that we are not even going to sip this. Right. This, we're pouring it out to the most high. This. $500 decanter, we're pouring it out as, as, a, as an offering to the Most High. Right, right. And, and so, you know, we, we get a wrong picture of sacrifices, but yet we see that these sacrifices will cease in, uh, in the end time. In order for them see, to cease, they have to begin. Mm -hmm. In order to begin, there has to be an altar. Mm -hmm. It has to be sanctified. It takes eight days according to the Torah with specific sacrifices to sanctify the altar. That's why Hanukkah, dedication, that's the eight day dedication of the altar after the pollution by Antiochus and the Greeks. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have everything that happened before is like rolling back around again, but yet there are some even bigger things that are going to take, you know, that, that take place before then that sets the stage. Yeah. And that's when we get into the prophecy of Joel. With Islamic influence now firmly seated in the Western world, undeniable progression toward the end times is well underway. What role does Islam play in the fulfillment of biblical prophecy? I believe the Islamic world is a missionary evangelist playground, and I want to see and I want to be part of the things that the Holy Spirit is doing in the earth, and there are amazing things that He's doing. In What in the World is Happening Before He Returns, Joel Richardson and Michael Rood reveal how to bring the truth of Yeshua to a Muslim world until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. It's like, get out there, we gotta change the world because the world is changing and it's gonna devour our children and our grandchildren. Order What in the World is Happening Before He Returns right now on DVD, Blu-ray, or USB. You'll get all four episodes as seen on Shabbat Night Live. What if our priorities were a little more focused on the gospel? I think the world would be a radically different place. Pre-order now or order online at arudeawakening.tv slash happening. What in the world is happening before he returns? Joel, there's, uh, uh, you have written books on the Islamic Antichrist. There's a, a, what does the scriptures teach about a Roman or Muslim Antichrist? There's a lot of things that the whole Christian world has been focused in on uh, concerning the end days. But one of the things that, that it seems to be ignored is the words of the prophets concerning this day. And, um, and I'm uh, thinking of uh, uh, something that's happened over these last few years, 2014-2015, uh, where on uh, Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles, we've had uh, four lunar eclipses, two years in a row, four lunar eclipses on those, uh, on those very days. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I had a real beef with uh, uh, some of the stuff that's going on out there at that time where people were calling them blood moons and, and all because um, your namesake, Joel, uh, specifies exactly what these things are. Uh, you know, what a blue moon is. Lunar eclipses, of course, are signs in the heavens. Right. This is uh, what the Creator set up. He put the sun, the moon, and the stars in their places, let them be for signs, for seasons, moedim, for, for uh, days and for years. It's mm -hmm. his reckoning of time, but the, his moedim, which are his remembrances, the, the feast of the Lord, these are based on the, uh, the movement of heavenly bodies and the signs that he puts in the heavens are very significant. And uh, what I, I saw happen is that people were just taking these lunar eclipses and just interpreting them wildly, completely out of context and actually calling them blood moons took them out of context. But uh, this brings us to an important point here in that we have a, uh, something that is going to cause the moon to turn into blood, 
which is an atmospheric event. When you have the sun darken, the stars darken, and the moon turn to blood, we are talking about an atmospheric event, something yeah. that we see from the earth. And yeah. uh, uh, just as the new moon, that's an atmospheric event. The moon is always full mm -hmm. from space, mm -hmm. but from our position, we have the, the, the cycles, uh, the, the lunar cycles, but um, we, we have something that is going to be coming up historically before the Messiah returns, and this is Joel chapter two, Joel's army. Let's talk about that a little bit because this brings into picture your whole world of study, your whole life of what's happening in the Islamic world with all these nations that want to completely incinerate every last Jew on the planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Almighty is just not going to let this thing happen. Right, right. Well, you know, it's interesting even that just that you started with that that the desire of the system of the Antichrist is to incinerate every Jew in the earth. Well, what's amazing, we know the scriptures say that that is their purpose, that's their goal, come let us wipe them out as a people, it says in Psalm 83. Um, in Islamic prophecy, in one of the, what's called the Hadith, these, this is just extra Quranic sacred prophecies, allegedly from the mouth of Muhammad, he says, Muhammad allegedly said, again, Muslims believe this, the day of resurrection will not come until the Muslims fight against the Jews and kill them, until there are only a few Jews left hiding behind a tree or a rock, and then the tree or the rock will cry out and say, oh Muslim, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. This hadith, this prophecy, is actually the very foundation and the center of the charter of Hamas. They actually say, the reason that Hamas has been founded is to fulfill this divine prophecy. That's our purpose for existence. And isn't it and amazing? And that's, uh, that's the government of uh, the Palestinians uh, in, in Israel. Yeah, that controls the whole Gaza Strip, not necessarily mm -hmm. the West Bank, but I mean, that is their very charter. And then people mm -hmm. say, well, you need to make peace with them. Make peace with a people whose very constitution says their divine destiny is to exterminate us. Hello. Now, a little sensitivity here. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, everyone wants to be the magnanimous, wonderful person that forces peace. Uh, it's, it's, it's insanity. But in terms of you know, what the scriptures say, the scriptures are clear that the Lord says in Joel and Zechariah, I will gather all of the nations. He, first he says all nations, but then he kind of hones in and gets more specific. He says the Goyim Saviv or the Am Saviv, which is the nations around about or the peoples round about. Mm -hmm. It's essentially mm -hmm. the neighbors. And they will gather together, bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, um, you know, and this is Jehoshaphat, not Joel so fat. It's if I, anyway, um, Jehoshaphat, I'll bring them down. And so this is Satan's purpose is mm -hmm. to exterminate Israel as a people. And we can see presently in the nations, the constellation of the nations, the movement of the nations, uh, particularly the nations around about Israel as they are moving toward that final satanic movement. Now we know the Lord's going to ultimately thwart it but it doesn't mean that they won't have some success. Well, let's, uh, let, let's read this. Joel chapter two, verse one. Uh, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Uh, Joel's trumpet. This yep. is, uh, uh, you, you actually use that in your, in your works, do you not? That's, that's my website, joelstrumpet.com. There, there it is. So uh, it's appropriate that we end this series with this particular prophecy uh, because he has been sounding out the warning. This is the Almighty was the one that gave him the name, gave him the background, gave him the insight so that he could decipher this and put this out to the world in an age where this message can go out by way of the internet, by way of television, by way of radio and television broadcast, Joel is sounding the trumpet, and this is what Joel the prophet, the ancient prophet said, to blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in all my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the Eretz, the land, tremble. For the day of Yehovah comes, it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains of great people and a strong, there hath not been the ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A flame, a fire devours before them. 
and behind them a flame burns. The land before them is like the Garden of Eden. Behind them it is a desolate, smoldering wasteland. Nothing is going to escape. There is nothing that is going to be able to stop this army. It looks like there is no hope. Israel is destroyed. It is over with. Mm -hmm. Except Israel has a Messiah. That's right. They are told to call a fast, a holy convocation, call everyone to weep, mm -hmm. rend their hearts, not their clothes, forget about your clothes, rend your hearts and cry out to Almighty God. And he is the one that will deliver them. Right. What we see here is a picture of the complete and utter destruction of the nation of Israel. This is the plan of the Islamic Jihad. Yeah. You know, and the thing of it is, is, you know, again, I'm obviously as pro-Israel, pro-Israel as one can get. But in the Christian world, in the Messianic world, we often say that, you know, half of the church uh, embraces replacement theology. They don't think Israel is relevant. Uh, they might, as Americans, say, well, I stand with Israel because I support a democracy in the Middle East and this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but much of the church says, well, I stand with Israel, which often translates as I stand with Israel politically, which means, you know, I'm going to defend them when the, the propaganda rises up, when people hate Israel, I support Israel. But there's also sort of this this um, unbiblical perspective on Israel that says Israel is always going to survive and thrive right up until the return of Jesus. But the scriptures are clear that this invasion, as I said, it will largely be successful. You know, in Matthew 24, this is the Olivet Discourse. Jesus gave the sermon, the discourse on the Mount of Olives. It's recorded in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and also Luke 21. Now, a lot of scholars say that the account in Luke 21 is different a different sermon than what was in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. I would argue that Jesus only gave one sermon on the Mount of Olives, and not, not, the, Mount, not the Sermon on the Mount, but it's this one sermon about the end times. And so in Matthew 24, Jesus says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, flee to the mountains. Let everyone who's in Judah, this is in the southern, flee to the mountains. In Luke 21, he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then let everyone flee to the mountains. And he says, at that time, and this is a verse that most Christians ignore, it says, you will be led captive to many nations. You will be taken captive. And we go, well, wait a minute. So you're saying that Jesus said that the modern state of Israel, that many of them, not all of them, but many of them would be led as captives to the surrounding nations. And I say the scriptures are absolutely clear that that is going to take place. And many of the prophets make it clear that that's going to take place. Um, people say, no, that's talking about the first century. Well, first of all, again, I don't believe Jesus gave multiple sermons that all are virtually identical except for one verse here or there. But beyond that, when we look at what actually transpired in the first century, we can read the account in Josephus that as the Roman armies were coming down, they started up in the north, they started taking armies in the north. It unfolded over about a four-year period. Then they finally came down with a little contingent and eventually they surrounded Jerusalem. If people had followed Jesus' advice, if that was about the first century, if they had waited until the city was surrounded by armies until they fled, they would have been captured and killed. If this was about the first century, then Jesus gave terrible advice. And I don't think he gave terrible advice. I think he was talking about the last days. And the time is coming. I don't understand how it works that Jerusalem will be surrounded by armies, that it coincides with the abomination of desolation. But the point is, the time is coming when Israel, many of the inhabitants, again, not all, will be led as captive to the nations. And that's the reason why Ezekiel, why so many of the prophets, at the time of the return of the Messiah, he says that many will come back to Israel, and he doesn't call them as former exiles, he says as former captives. And it refers to them as the survivors. It refers to them as the remnant, as the, the residue of my people. It always refers to the survivors. Why is it this, the survivors that will be saved? Because it's the survivors of Israel that will be saved. Something is coming in Israel, Jesus said, that it is nothing, this tremendous nothing, this terrible, no distress has been this bad since the founding of the world until that time. Mm -hmm. And we as believers who have been, I mean, you're Jewish, I'm a Gentile, I've been grafted in. I should be dead, I should be in hell right now, but the Jewish Messiah reached out and grabbed me because Israel has been hardened, dumb Gentile like myself has been allowed to be brought in. It is my 
mandate my responsibility to stand with the Jewish people in the midst of their trial and to identify and, in my opinion, be distressed, go through the tribulation with them as part of this identification with the God of Israel and with the Messiah of Israel. Let's uh, take a look at, at this uh, at this prophecy in the light of these other other things that you brought up there, because uh, you know it'd be nice if we had one book and it told us exactly what's going to tra take place, but. Uh, you know, thankfully, that's not how it's done. You know, we, we have to, you know, we have to really put our heart into it. We have to pray, and by prayer and by study, uh, letting the creator of the heavens and the earth open our understanding to this. Mm -hmm. uh, when when I, I, I see this prophecy in Joel, uh, and what happens with this invading army, nothing can stop them. There is, uh, uh, you know, a complete and utter destruction that looks like this is what's going to happen. And if not for the hand of the Almighty, uh, when the people cry out and cry and call upon the name of Yahovah, mm -hmm. and it's in there very specifically about this. And that's mm -hmm. why, one of the reasons why I believe it's very significant, uh, you know, I never grew up this way, but now I know very significant that his name has been hidden, but yet, but uh, he, he says that, you know, the reason I brought you out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, so the whole world will know that my name is Yehovah. Mm -hmm. And even though the, the name has been obscured, uh, a, a vowel pointing was removed from most of the text, but yet it has survived. He's watched over his word, and so we actually know how to call upon his name. I, I, think, I think that he's really wanting us to, to understand his name. And to, and to call upon his name and that we will see deliverance when, when we do that. Yeah. And I'm not negating the fact that Jesus Christ saved my life. He, he literally, Jesus Christ saved my life. And after I got to know him, then he let me know his real name and asked me if I, from now on, if I please remember it. Okay, yeah. uh, there's a reason why the angel Gabriel said to call him Yeshua for Yoshia. Okay, the angel Gabriel literally said that, not Yehoshua, not the formal, but the Yeshua, the, the friendly, intimate name of Yehoshua. Yeah. That's what we read it in, in uh, the Hebrew Matthew. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, we, we can uh, mispronounce his name and all, but I think that, that he's keep on baiting us and he wants us to know him more intimately. And once we know more intimately, then he reveals himself more to us. And so as, as the nation of Israel are called to repentance, it is then that that army, their stench reaches heaven. He completely annihilates them. As uh, it says in Isaiah, he drives them far off, far off. And so Israel gets more land back. Finally, all the land from the Euphrates and the Nile goes into the hands of Israel at the, at the culmination of this. And we see that because of this war, the sun's darkened, the stars are darkened, the moon is turned to blood because of the stratosphere is darkened. And, but it is at that time that it says that then he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. It'll be a, as it says, the early rain and the latter rain. See, I, I am watching for this to transpire as the, uh, I say the fall feast begin their intermediate fulfillment mm -hmm. because this has to take place first. Sure. This, this total uh, annihilation that looks like annihilation, but it is reversed and the Almighty then restores to them all the years that it would have taken to rebuild the land, but yet he says he's gonna, the former rain, the latter rain, the, 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 the whole land is going to blossom like it never has before. Even though before the army comes in, it looks like the Garden of Eden and behind them it's a smoldering wasteland, but yet, and you'd think that after a war like that, that the land would be desolate, but no. He's gonna turn this all about and then the latter rain outpouring, the double portion of the Holy Spirit given. And I look at this time is that this is when, it talks about this, now we step into Isaiah 49, that from the east, the west, the south, and from the land of China, they come into the land. The Gentiles come into the land and they're bringing with them on the shoulders the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. That Israel, Zion cries out, we've been forsaken. And it says, no, I've not forsaken you. I can't forsake you. And, you know, a sucking uh, you know, a mother giving suck to her child may forget, but I'm not going to forget you. 
And then we see that all these nations come into Israel and they say there's not enough room for us. Wait, a few verses later it says, where are all these children come? I've lost all my children. You know, the prophets say two thirds will be dead in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. Seven months to bury the dead. These are prophecies before the Messiah returns. And it's because I believe we've had the wool pulled over our eyes, and I was one of the wool puller overs, mm -hmm. that we're all gonna be out of here before anything bad happens, that, that people are, are, have been blinded to what is about to transpire, and we need to wake up. We need to understand that, that you know, what has happened in the past with, uh, with, with Rome and the concept of the Antichrist and all, well, those things have kind of gone away and we're seeing a whole new Islamic mayhem enter into this thing to where the nations round about are the ones coming in to exterminate all of Israel. Yeah, and you know, I mean, you still have some people that are just so bound with that whole, look, I'm a Protestant, I have issues with Catholic doctrine, liturgy, and I understand that. But you know, again, I traveled to Iraq a lot and. You know, when you have a Chaldean Catholic Iraqi who is, you know, his family is being beheaded by radical Muslims, and then you have this American Protestant saying, yeah, the Catholic's the problem. I Catholic go, priest hanging on crosses right now over there. And I go, yeah. um, I actually, I think that we can see the beast right in front of us. Satan is not discriminating between Catholic, Orthodox, Coptic, Protestant, Messianic. You know, we, we, we can get caught up on our doctrine. It's good to have our doctrine, but sometimes we get caught up on um, discriminating among the brethren. And look, there's wheat and tares everywhere. I understand that, but Satan's not discriminating. Sometimes we need to be um, a little bit more gracious toward one another. That's a side issue, you know. You've got this, this story, a lot of people think just Jesus comes back and he just sort of snaps his fingers and just, you know, a rainbow wave sweeps the earth and everything's renewed and restored. Uh, the scriptures say he comes back with a sword, not a magic wand, um, you know? <laughs> and I mean, you look at... <laughs> that, you're right, you're right. <laughs> you look at, um, you know, Revel Revelation 19, he comes back, he, he bursts forth from heaven, he's soaked in blood. Now, that's actually not the return of Jesus. Jesus has already returned. I don't fully understand is this picture, he's on a white horse. Where, whose blood is it? And most Christians will say, well, it's his blood or it's the blood of the martyrs. No, Isaiah 63 is the passage which Revelation 19 is built upon. And it says, Isaiah is in Jerusalem looking out toward Edom, a dome which is down in southwest Jordan, northwest Saudi Arabia. Who is this robed in splendor coming up out of Arabia, out of the desert, out Basra. of Edom, out mm -hmm. of Basra? Mm -hmm. And why are your robes soaked in blood? And it's Yeshua. And he responds and he said, it is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. And he said, I have soaked my robes and I have crushed my enemies. Their lifeblood splattered all my garments. Yeshua comes back to crush the enemies of his people. Because as you said, you know, he says, can a woman forget her child? And then he goes, see, no, the Lord goes, are you kidding me? The God of Israel could forget Israel. He goes, it's an absurdity. See, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Half the church today, he says, no, God has forsaken Israel. God says, nonsense. Paul says, far be it, you know, far be it from God that you know, may it never be. The church needs to wake up and realize that we are the branches, that he is the root, and we have been grafted into this olive tree, that we are not the source, we are not the foundation of this thing. We, by the grace and mercy of God, have been brought in. We need to have discernment in terms of what the prophets declare is coming, because we don't want to be, you know, when Jesus, it says in Joel 2, he goes, oh, you, all you regions of Philistia, talking about Gaza, Ekron, all mm -hmm. that, and, all, and you entire, that's northern Lebanon, ba basically saying Hamas, Hezbollah. He says, what have you against me? You've divided up my land. He goes, if you think you're going to pay me back for something I've done, I will swiftly and speedily pour, pour it all back on your own head. The Lord takes a very political position. He comes back to defend Israel against the the terrorist, hateful, those that harbor the eternal, everlasting hatred in their hearts as opposed to his everlasting covenant. And God forbid that as a Christian who names the name of Jesus, of Yeshua, that we would be on the wrong side of that battle when he comes back. Yeah, that would be a very bad place to be in. 
his covenant. His covenant, uh, we, we see these uh, in two pictures. One is um, uh, when the, the commandments were shouted down from Mount Sinai. After the 10th commandment, the, you know, we cried out, Moses, let us never hear the voice of the Almighty again. You go up, whatever he tells you, you come down and tell us, and we promise we'll obey. Mm -hmm. But we are afraid we're gonna die. Mm -hmm. So Moses goes up on the mountain. The Almighty gives more instructions. Moses comes down and he writes it in a scroll. Then they sacrifice bulls with gallons of blood all day long. He takes branches of hyssop and shakes it on the people. It takes all day to do that. Mm. He shakes it upon the altar and upon the scroll that he wrote the covenant on. And he said, this is the blood covenant. Mm. And you know, in the Western world, most people have no idea well, blood covenant, what does that mean? Well, it means whoever breaks the covenant is as dead as the blood of that animal that is sprinkled on you. Right. If the Almighty breaks his covenant, he dies. If Israel breaks the covenant, they die. Mm -hmm. Moses shortly after is then called up in the mountain to get the revelation concerning the building of the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, table of showbread, and the last thing, the Almighty gives them the tables of stone. It says, get down there, something bad's going down. When he goes down, see what's happened. First commandment, thou shalt have no other gods in my face. What do they, and so the Almighty says, stand back Moses, I'm gonna kill them all. I'll start over with you, I'm gonna kill them all. Moses said, forget it. You're not starting over when they figure something else out. And that's why the Almighty put the sacrifices of animals, bulls and goats and lambs and rams, as a continual reminder that the death penalty is owed. Yeah. And until the death penalty is paid by the offending party or one who never breaks the covenant and dies in the place of the guilty party, until that's done, that continual reminder is there. Mm -hmm. But once that was fulfilled, that's why the temple was destroyed. That's why there are no blood sacrifices in Jerusalem and the, uh, the Day of Atonement sacrifice was never effectual. The miracle that took took place uh, for, for generations, never took place again, the year Yeshua was crucified. Now we go back, we're gonna go all the way back to the beginning. What was that covenant was made with Abraham? Abraham was put to sleep. Almighty God walked through that blood. Mm -hmm. It's on him. Whoever fights against his covenant with Abraham, that all the land from the Euphrates takes up half of Iraq all the way to the great river in Egypt, that is the covenant that all these people are fighting against. This is what our nation has been surreptitiously fighting against, trying to circumvent this, trying to have Israel give away this land. But it's not going to work, is it, Joel? No, it's not gonna work. I love that you you know, use that. Again, most Westerners were so detached from blood sacrifice, we don't even know where our, the meat that we buy at the grocery store comes from. You know, There was an animal that was slaughtered to get that meat. We're so detached from the concept of blood sacrifice. Uh, the Lord had Abraham cut a bull, these animals in half, he makes a path. God is saying as he does this, he goes, Abraham, if I don't fulfill and keep, and if I'm not faithful to the promise that I'm making you to give you and your descendants this land, then may I die like these gory, bloody, smelly, severed animals. And I think, yeah. and I, I know you know, God is faithful. And that's really what this comes down to. It's not about a theological argument. It's about the fact that God is faithful. He is going to do everything that he said he's going to do. And if we don't have confidence in God being faithful to Israel, then where do we stand? But God is faithful, and all of the good promises that he made will be fulfilled, and as we've said before, we will see it with our eyes, we will smell it, we will smell the fragrance of the, of the barbecue in Jerusalem in our glorified, resurrected bodies, and we will see Yeshua himself in the flesh on the throne. Those that went before us, we will embrace and hug. This is biblical hope. I am so looking forward to that day. Well, the Messiah will confirm the covenant made in his blood. The Messiah is going to reign upon this earth. 4,000 years ago, the creator of the heavens and the earth made an everlasting covenant with Abraham. All the land from the Euphrates to the Nile belongs to the sons of Israel. Shockwaves will shake the earth as heaven reaches down to fulfill that covenant. And all those who stand against that covenant will find themselves on the battlefield against the Almighty. I'd like to close in prayer. Joel, first of all, thank you. Thank it's you a so blessing, much. brother. Great. Thank you for, for, for your life of service. Thank May you, Yah man. bless you in all that you do. Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessing upon Joel. 
and everything that he touches. May it turn to gold in the kingdom. May you fill him with more and more wisdom. And may you lead him by your spirit to touch millions and millions of lives. May you open doors all over the world to where your voice through him goes out to minister. May he reach so many in, in the, the Muslim faith to recognize Yeshua as the Messiah and step over the line and into the kingdom. We thank you for this and we all say around the world, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen. Well, Shabbat Shalom, Torah fan, Shavuot Tov. We'll see you next week, Shabbat Night Live. Or we'll see you when the smoke clears. <laughs>